we're gonna be talking to Shanshan Hishe uh, you know, about the future of low carbon cooling systems in districts. Uh, so Shanshan is a PhD researcher at Muses. Uh, her research interests focus on cooling supply systems, modeling and design. Uh, in this area, she explores energy efficient design options through the integration of energy potentials, for example, solar, uh, energy conversion technologies, uh, thermal networks, and air conditioning systems in the tropical context. Basically, the full stack of technological solutions from the building to the district scale. In the project, she's also contributing to the development of the open source energy analysis tool, the City Energy Analyst. All right, welcome, Shansha. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jimena. So, hi everyone. Uh, this is Shan Shan. I'm the PhD candidate in the new system. In my research, I look into efficient ways to supply cooling to buildings in the future. Let's first give you a quick example of how the cooling systems are transforming. This is a photo of our campus in the National Re University of Singapore. If you see the rooftop of older office building, you will probably see it being occupied by cooling towers. However, in newer buildings like this one, you can see the landscape has changed from only having cooling towers to having PV panels or green spaces for recreational activities. The cooling towers are moved to the centralized locations, which are the district cooling plants. The plants on our campus is located on the upper right of the photo. In my research, I aim to develop a framework to analyze these different options of cooling supply systems. So the main motivation to look into the cooling system is because the space cooling demand will become the largest share of electricity consumption in buildings by 2050. This stressed the urgency of improving the energy efficiencies of our cooling systems. We can already see many existing solutions to improve energy efficiencies of cooling supply. These solutions include system interventions at both building and district levels. At the building level, there is a trend to decouple the conventional all air systems into humidity and temperature control systems. The humidity control systems removes the humidity in the air flows and the temperature control systems only remove sensible heat in the indoor space. Many studies have showcased uh, energy saving potentials of this type of systems and each system alternatives incorporates different types of technologies to conduct the cooling process. Therefore, we call this type of systems hybrid cooling systems. At the district scale, district cooling systems has been regarded as an effective measure to enhance efficiency and save space. Instead of having the cooling supply system at the buildings, these systems are located in the centralized location and the chilled water is then distributed through the underground pipelines. This system changes at the building and district scales leads to my research questions. What is the minimum uh, goal of cooling energy requirements of hydrocooling systems in the buildings? What is the best hydrocooling systems for each building and each building use types? What is the optimum supply system configuration and the operation strategy? In order to answer, answer this question, I first conducted a literature review on the existing hydrocooling systems. I generalized different types of hybrid cooling systems into three units according to their fun function. The first is the outdoor air units that host the technologies that condition the ventilation air flows. And some technologies utilize the exhaust airflow to perform energy recovery. The second function is to remove humidity of indoor air by recirculating the indoor air through cooling technologies. They are hosted by the recirculated air unit. And the third is the sensible cooling units, which host the technologies to lower the temperature of indoor space. The sensible cooling units often use radiant panels that runs at a 17 degree chill water. And the recirculated air units often uses cooling coils to condense water out from the air. And the main difference of different types of hybrid, hybrid cooling systems lies in the technologies that's used in the outdoor air unit. So some common technologies that are being used in the tropical uh, context are cooling coil, that's the conventional one, and then the heat wheels or solid desiccant wheels that conduct uh, heat energy recovery between the exhaust air and the outdoor air liquid desiccants that also removes the humidity 
and uh, temperature from the outdoor air, as well as a direct evaporative cooler and indirect evaporative cooler that use a secondary airflow through evapor evaporation of water droplets to uh, reduce the temperature of the primary airflow. So in my research, I uh, categorized them and concluded five realistic hybrid cooling systems with different combinations of the technologies that are here mentioned here. And before the comparison of different hybrid cooling systems, we have to first identify the benchmark. The benchmark is the minimum cooling load that can be achieved by an ideal system. To achieve this, I employ the technique that has been widely used to improve energy efficiencies of industrial processes. It is called energy integration. Energy integration is done by analyzing all thermal streams in the process and then identifying all possible heat exchange between these thermal streams to achieve minimum heat recovery. And when the process achieve max, sorry, is the maximum heat recovery. So when we achieve the maximum heat recovery, that results into the minimum loads that we need to supply. And the benefits of using energy integration is that it could calculate the minimum loads without knowing the specific placement of heat exchanger in the vents. So besides energy integration, we also use um, exergy analysis to quantify the quality of energy needed by the thermal streams in the cooling processes. It describes the amount of work that is required by an ideal cooling machine. The exergy value of the environment is zero. So when the temperature of the cooling process is closer to the environmental temperature, the exergy value is lower. The general goal is to supply the cooling loads at temperatures that are close to the environment. For example, the environmental temperature today in Singapore is around 30 degrees. So the temperature of the cooling process can be visualized here in the uh, grand composite curve. Here you can see the cooling process required temperature from 30 degree to 10 degree. And the area between the grand composite curve and the X axis on the top is the exergy value. In this figure, we can see the cooling load is 82 kilowatt hour and the exergy value is 2.5 kilowatt hour. This gives us an indication of how much electricity will a cooling conversion technology is consumed to supply the cooling loads. Here we have an example of one cooling conversion technology that supplies chilled water at six degrees. The exergy value of the amount of cooling supplied are higher than the exergy consumption of the process, and it results in the exergy loss we see in the green area. So here we see the opportunity to reduce the exergy loss if we could supply a portion of chill water at a higher temperature. After setting up the models of hybrid cooling system and the performance indicators, we perform optimization over a typical period of time that could represent an annual operation of hybrid cooling systems in buildings. The objective of the optimization is to minimize electricity consumption. This electricity consumption includes the exergy of the cooling process, as well as the electricity consumed by fans and pumps to move the air and water around. The variables we are looking at are the supply air temperatures in the outdoor air units and the recirculated air units. The quantity of the mass flow in all the units are also the variables of interest because it represents how big we should size the systems. And, um, and, and also how the, so, so, the, so the optimization, then we employed optimization, sorry, and results, the optimization results could show us a different set of operation strategy, meaning the different numbers, values in these variables in each time step. And here, just to reconnect to the uh, grand composite curve, here the goal is to reduce the exergy consumption. And moving on, after comparing the hybrid cooling systems at the building level, we look at the supply system design when, with this hybrid cooling systems. The objective here is to determine the supply systems with the least amount of exergy loss and low capital cost at the same time. The capital costs include the cost for chillers, cooling towers, and cooling networks. The variable of interest are um, here, the placement of the chillers, whether it should be at the plant or at the buildings. If we have building chillers, what should be the operation temperatures in each building? If we have the chillers at the plant, what should be the supply and return temperatures of the network? Here, again, just to recap, to connect to the uh, grand composite curve, 
Here, we are trying to reduce the exergy losses between the supply system and the cooling processes. So the supply system configuration describes the placement of the cooling supply system. Here, so where are the chillers and cooling towers? And I could show you a range of all that has cool chillers and cooling towers at buildings, so there's no network. We could also have a central, totally entirely centralized uh, configurations that only has the cooling systems in the plants. And we could also have many different configurations in between that are either fully supplied by the network or have partially use, using the cooling by, from the network and uh, supply its own cooling from, from the building level systems. Now, we could look at the results. So the first finding from my analysis is the method to, is to demonstrate that this method could successfully determine the minimum exergy requirement in hyper, of hypercooling systems in any building. Here you can see the minimum exergy requirement, which is the area color in gray, at one time step of different building use types. There are hotel, office, and retail. This turns in, uh, the, the turns here you can see in the composite curves is the heat is showing us where are the temperature levels of the heat recovery that is being that's that is taking place. So more details on the interpretations of these curves will be can be found in the paper that is being under preparation. And the same method could also be used to compare different types of hypercooling systems. Here I'm showing you two hypercooling systems, one only with cooling coils, and another one uses desiccant wheels to perform energy recovery. Here you could see the difference between um, the between these two hypercooling systems with and without heat recovery. So we we could on the graph we could visualize the cooling loads that is being saved from the energy recovery in the desiccant wheels. We could also see that the hypercooling system with desiccant wheels require less amount of cooling loads at lower temperatures compared to the hypercooling systems with cooling coils. And next, we could aggregate all the uh, energy requirements of, of, of each time step and compare the annual operation of these hypercooling systems in buildings. Here you can see the result of applying five realistic hypercooling systems and one ideal hypercooling systems in different buildings. The results shows that the hybrid cooling systems with desiccant wheels performs the best. Here we can see. Here is the best and following by the uh, direct evaporative cooling and the other technologies. You can see that the best performing systems is down here re normally requires 40 to 60 percent less electricity than the worst performing systems. That is the purple one up here. So we can also observe that the performance ranking remains the same for all buildings, whether they are different geometries or in different use building use types. This result is interesting because that means that in this specific context, you can only you only need to analyze one building geometry and one building type use type to determine the best systems. The last on the supply system design. Here I'm showing you the uh, latest result on comparing supply systems with node network and the, the centralized network. And I applied it on the, in the district. It is uh, from, extracted from the central business district of Singapore. So it has the 50% of office, 22% of retail, and 45% of hotels. So in the buildings, we compare the uh, status quo cooling systems with a fixed supply temperature Cooling co hypercooling systems with cooling coils, also hypercooling systems with desiccant wheels. Um, so, and then we could see here is the results. So the bar charts show the total annualized cost, and it's split into operation cost and uh, capital cost. The first thing we could observe is that in the context of tropical climates. The cooling is operating all year round and around 80% of the total cost is used for system operation. If we compare the capital cost of the configuration with and without network, there is a 
25% cost reduction in the cooling technologies because all buildings with different demand profiles are sharing the same technologies in the cooling plants now. However, there are extra expenses on network construction, which brings the total capital cost back to a similar value as a configuration with no network. And the temperature used in the hybrid cooling system with cooling coils are higher than the references, uh, than the status quo here. Uh, here you can see it's 10 degree. And this, this result, this is a resulting from the optimization trying to improve the chiller efficiencies by operating at the higher temperature. And the temperature used in the, um, however, the temperature used in the hybrid cooling systems with desiccant wheels is lower than the hybrid cooling system only using cooling coils, but it's still higher than the reference case. So here, here we could see a lower, lower temperature because uh, the air that the cooling coil is receiving is already drier. However, the total, uh, the, the operation cost is lower because the cooling load is lower. So in terms of total cost saving, we could see in the system with no network, there's a 29% cost saving using hybrid cooling systems with cooling coil and 42% for uh, hybrid cooling systems with desiccant wheels. And, we, and then also the same could be ups, uh, same, same magnitude of saving could be observed in the network. In general, we could conclude that the tropical context it can bring up to 40% cost saving if we deploy hybrid cooling systems at buildings. And the next step of uh, next step will be looking into the decentralized network uh, to supply the uh, supply systems. Yeah, but in the uh, I will not show the results here, and the upcoming results will be included in this publication that's shown below. So. All in all, the impact of this research is that we successfully develop a methodology that can identify the best hybrid cooling systems and supply systems in, um, in the urban, urban district. And this information could help engineers and assist on system selections in the design process. And the same methodology could be extended to any other climatic areas. And if you are interested, there are uh, more information to be found in my publications. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that, Shenshen. Uh, I think uh, uh, your your last conclusion about the uh, when you talk about the results basically left us wanting more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it will happen in the next publications. Uh, so for now, I would like to open the floor to uh, to our attendees or also panelists to make questions for to Shenshen. So I give you a few seconds, minutes for somebody to write their questions in the Q&A. Okay. Maybe, uh, Sean, I have a question on, on your last slide on 13. Uh, yes. Yeah, this one. So could, could you explain a little bit um, on the the difference on your findings of network versus no network so, for the different technologies? So the technologies are, are basically the same, but because at we, if we have a network, that means that we could use the same uh, chiller that supply cooling for, for example, office in, during daytime and hotel during night times. So there, there, there we could have a saving in the uh, smaller size chillers or the mm. total chiller capacity will be smaller. Yeah. And, mm. But at the same time, in, because we have to transport all this cold water, so we have, to, uh, we have to operate the chiller at a lower temperature compared in to having the chillers at the buildings. So here we also lose a bit, bit of the efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now, one of, the, one of the big debates in heating is, uh, of course, the more efficient buildings get and the, the less they use uh, for thermal demands the more basically this relation of decentralized versus centralized flips um, in, in terms of reducing the amount of energy they actually need to, to have delivered. What is, what, is your, what is your position on that for the cooling purposes? Um, so, so you're saying that if the demand gets higher, actually we, we are worse off of having a centralized network? 
Now let's assume our buildings get even more efficient. So what we propose is to dramatically reduce energy efficiency, which means they, they decrease in cooling load. And I would assume at some point there's a there's this tipping point when it makes sense to supply them centrally because of the losses that occur and and uh, the investment you have to take. So what is yeah. your position on that? So here you can also see that actually everything we save is everything we save in the capital cost is being compensated by the network cost. So we don't in total we don't save too much on the investment. And then here, um, yeah, more optimization could be done for the operation, but you can also see that the operation doesn't really, in, if you already have a very efficient system for the building, the operation of the uh, plants doesn't really add more, um, a lot more value on the efficiencies. But there is, this is under the condition of perfectly operating world that every single building has a perfect uh, operator that knows exactly how to operate their systems. And this we only see more in the centralized plants, like the examples of Singapore District Cooling. They have a very dedicated team to achieve yeah. optimum operation. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, I can also add something is that as soon as you centralize, then you share the, the extreme conditions. So you have to be able to supply everything with the centralized plant, which means also that you lose the opportunities for, um, it has been seen by Shanshan in the uh, in the local integration. So you can see that you have, in fact, needs at different temperature levels. And that's what we hope to show in the uh, decentralized networks is that we can share them, uh, distribute the cold at a higher temperature uh, and do the extreme conditions uh, in a decentralized way, uh, which when we would then uh, in fact, leads to a better solution uh, at the uh, total cost. All right. Thanks for that. We have uh, another question from the audience. Uh, in just five more minutes from this. Uh, so, Matthias Sulzer asks Shan Shan, mm -hmm. uh, will you also vary the technology allocation? That's it. District, I think Matthias means district cooling for sensitive heat, uh, for sensible heat, and decentralized technology for latent heat. Yes, so this is exactly what I would look into in the decentralized network. There you could decide a different types of operation temperatures. So maybe the plants could also supply at a higher uh, temperature that reduce the heat loss. But then there we, we will see the trade off of requiring higher pumping loads because we, uh, the the delta T is not so much there. Yeah. And right. I have done a first principle analysis. Actually, it shows us a, a, a result that's counterintuitive. So we, they say we should supply the uh, low temperature at the plant and higher temperature at the buildings. But I, would, I, would, I could update you with the uh, full optimization results there in the coming publication. All right. Thank you for that, Chen Chen. Now we have a question by Ben. Ben asks, uh, Chen Chen, what are the main challenges facing adoption of future hybrid cooling systems in buildings? Um, so actually for, I think the challenge will be in the renovation type of building. But if you have a new types of building, I don't see there is a, there is a difference because you're also building a cooling system. So it's a, it's a matter of system selection. And uh, maybe until now, the cost is still higher, but it's a matter of economy of scale to see if the cost will go down. And um, yeah. Um, I, I think I can add to that from the experience of sewing. In the 3 for 2 project, we, we built one of those hybrid cooling systems um, in a, a lab situation, so in a real real life situation, a living lab with uh, roughly 35 people in an office space, and it, the technology works well. It's it's there are challenges that relate to to the, the planning and design of those systems, um, because obviously it gets more challenging to have these different streams and different temperatures organized. Um, you also need to basically invest in two systems at the end, right? You have a separate system uh, for, for the temperature level you're looking at, uh, which means uh, you're, you're increasing the installation. However, 
economic analysis in 3 for 2 has shown that uh, there's a trade-off that is reached rather quickly after I think it was between six and, and nine years you have the break even and then for the rest of the lifetime you actually have um, uh, savings not only energy savings but also um, space savings so if you install and integrate them in a, in a good way you have benefits of rentable space and less volume you actually need to build with these type of systems because they're more more uh, specific to the demands that appear. Um, so at the end, it's a trade-off. The systems are more complicated, more challenging, and, and require high invest at the beginning. But the trade-off happens uh, rather soon if you look at that at the life cycle perspective. Yeah, if I may add that it will also answer the question of Matthias on, on the, the use of the PV surpluses. The, the control system is very important in this case because we have more than one system for one purpose and therefore the understanding of what is uh, really needed is, is very important and how it can be operated is also very important. And by creating afterwards, um, so the, the centralized, decentralized systems uh, combined, the, all what is related to predictive control uh, so meaning forecasting the, the demand using all the capacities and buffer tanks that we have in order to uh, supply the needs is uh, becoming more and more important and is and will be the key. So at the end, that would be uh, for sure the, the, the solution, but it needs uh, advances in, in control and perhaps also in standards. So what Shan Shan has, for example, shown is that so the air flows uh, or the, the air renewal flows are related to carbon dioxide and uh, content and not anymore or to the VOC and not anymore to the, to the humidity. All right, thank you, Francois. I think we have time for one last question by Anonymous who asked Chen Chen, how much mature are the hybrid cooling technologies considered in this study? Are these technologies available in the market from the vendors? Okay, uh, as Arno introduced many times, so we actually conducted a pilot study that installed one type of hybrid cooling system with desiccant wheels in uh, Singapore. And during my literature review, I also see this kind of systems being an, uh, installed and analyzed in Hong Kong and um, in Hong Kong and southern China. And in fact, I was in the uh, conference in Hong Kong like four years ago, and there I met many engineers and uh, air conditioning engineers, and they're like, yes, yes, this is a system we're gonna build. Like they are very excited about this new, new types of systems as well. And then they already claim that they are already building this. All right, fantastic. All right, thank you for that, Shen Shen.